nation. I do not know whether or not that nation will survive the globalization. Perhaps I think some people argue that nation cannot survive globalization. Especially the small nation. If you want to have a good performance, I'm talking about economic performance here, and then you have to sacrifice to a certain extent nation building. Why we should be uncomfortable with these uh, uh, three, uh, three, three phases, or why we should make it like a citizenship is the primary way to do it, rather than uh, see these three things coexist together and then see that what is needed in order uh, to sustain Singapore as a, I mean, to continue to be, uh, uh, I mean, progress in the globalization and also in the future. Yeah. I don't know whether or not, whether or not that uh, I understand your question, but what I'm going to say here is this. No? As far as Singapore is concerned, do we want to have, do we want to accept so-called foreign talents? The answer is yes. But how many? Half of the population? 40%? 30%? 10%? Because if you have more than 50%, you cannot build a nation. Therefore, the number has to be restricted to a point that you feel comfortable. I think we should not blindly and you know, against you know the migrants and so forth. Because basically our forefathers they are migrants. This was now Singapore is the only migrant society or migrant not sorry, is the only migrant state in Southeast Asia. In Southeast Asia you have eleven states all of them are indigenous states. Indigenous states, which means that they are indigenous population who claim to be the lords of the land, or the sons of the soil. Only Singapore is a migrant state. Just like the United States is also a migrant state. Being a migrant state, it seems to me that we have no choice we cannot close our door. There is a definition of a migrant state. But the problem here, I think, is not about whether or not the, uh, I mean, the migrants are going to change anything and so forth. You know? I think whether or not that we can deal with it comfortably. Can we continue to be voted in? <laughs> Would the Singaporeans, you know, feel comfortable? That was, I think, the issue. And then we need also to talk about this when we say, are you a Singaporean? Oh, yes, I am a Singaporean. But do you say that you are a Singaporean Chinese or you are a Chinese Singaporean? They are two different concepts, you know. If you say you are Singaporean Chinese, you emphasize the Chineseness. But if you say that you are Chinese Singaporeans, that you stress your Singaporeanness. What happens if your interest, ethnic interest, come into conflict with the state interest? Which one prevail? If you are a nationalist, nation prevail. If you are an, an advocate of the ethnic city, ethnic interests prevail. This is what we call nation building, in fact. You know. And as far as Singapore is concerned, the state of nation building is still very low. We have to continue to build a nation, to make the nation you know, a strong one. But under this kind of situation, it's very tough. What we can do, in fact, is, all right, we sacrifice a bit. 
we control the population to make it comfortable, to make it uh, so that it can be absorbed gradually, then we can become a Singapore nation. And I think some of the Singaporeans feel they are more comfortable being an ethnic Singaporean, right, and a Singaporean Singaporean, you know. But some Singaporeans perhaps feel that they do not want to have too many adjectives. We have been here, we are born and brought up here as Chinese from our parents. I would put my roots here. I'm a Singaporean Chinese. But if my question right now is that we are, are we entering into a crisis? Are we putting ourselves economic digits to prove ourselves quality of life at the expense of nation building? Yes. If we stop progressing economically, economically, we will be like, okay, I have to mention a country, very dirty areas in the Indonesian island. I don't want that to happen. But now, is there a possibility, a dialogue, the government officials with citizens like us, open, very transparent dialogue, why are we accepting more than 50% and beyond foreigners that just come to, be, to our, our country as a jumping board? After a certain period of time, they pluck out. They go to the US, back to their own countries. Dual citizenship. Do we want to allow that to happen? And how did the government arrive at that point? single or dual citizens to foreigners who step into our land? This is my question. Yeah, okay. I, I, I like to answer the question. First of all, I want to say though, I do not know the figure, the exact figure, how much foreigners that we have here. Just now, when I say 50%, 40%, it was just a kind of argument, you know. I, I, but. I, I think if you want to know that, I have to go back and try to study how many of them, in fact, you know. But, but now, I think it is at the still comfortable level or not. Uh, this is uh, very, I think, important. I'm not saying that now we are really far flooded by the foreigners, therefore, you know, uh, and, and uh, the Singaporeans now uh, uh, do not feel comfortable anymore. But perhaps I think because this is not a political the forum, we are not arguing that, is it? Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, another thing is this, ethnicity and nationhood. I think it is important uh, that I want to raise here for, uh, for one reason. If you overemphasize, if you overstress ethnicity, you ignore nationhood, it's very dangerous. What happened, for instance, there is a racial conflict or ethnic the conflict. If you like, if you say that you are, uh, I mean, you want to emphasize the ethnicity, then the ethnic conflict would continue, would prevail, would escalate. But for the sakes of the nation, you have to sacrifice then you have to put the interest of the nation, the survival of the nation first, then make sure that ethnic conflict can be contained. Now this is why I continue to say is that, how do you call yourself? If you call yourself, I'm a Chinese Singaporean and I'm a Singaporean Chinese, they are two different concepts in fact. When you say, I'm, I'm a Singaporean Chinese, Chinese is very important. I do not get along with this particular group, you know. I don't like this group. I want to get rid of this particular group. But if you ask, if you say that I'm a Singaporean Chinese, uh, I, no, sorry, uh, Chinese Singaporeans, then I say, look, I have to tolerate this. You know, because we are in the same family. We want to have this uh, prosperous country. We want to live together as 
Rupert Emerson says, we want to have a common destiny for the future. You do not want to live alone. Now, in that sense, I think ethnic city and nationhood here have to be differentiated. Which one is more important? For me, if I'm, I'm a nationalist, I say, nation is more important than ethnic city. My question to you is if you can share your expertise. Um, you have edited a lot of books about the overseas Chinese, and um, I pose this question to you. Do you see a future of, for the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia, um, their, their future here? Uh, I asked this question because I wanted to share something with you. Recently, I went to see this man called, uh, I call him Uncle Ing Sim, and Uncle Ing Sim happened to be the son of uh, Tan Lak Sai. So I asked Uncle, I said, I'm not interested in what you think about the Chinese here, but I'm interested in what Mr. Tan Lak Sai used to tell you, your father, in the 1960s about uh, Singapore when he was in exile in uh, um, the People's Republic of China. And he said to me, he shared with me, he said that actually he sees that he doesn't see a future for the overseas Chinese in this region. He said that we'll always perennially be um, guests here. We can contribute to the indigenous societies here. But we must always remember that we are, we are guests here and that Singapore is really, uh, uh, as you mentioned just now about the product of colonial state, right? I, he, he, made, he made a, a very lucid comment. He told me that his father said to him that Singapore is the creation from an ouster from Johor. You know, the British took that. So similarly with Penang from the Sultanate of Kedah as well. So I'm just wondering to ask you, when I, when I said, he, he counted to me, and he said that you don't have to worry about the nationhood, sense of nationhood, about the indigenous people, the Malay population here. The worry is always about the problematic relationship of the Chinese people who cannot assimilate well for some reason or another in such big numbers. Maybe in the 18th century, if you look at history, in smaller dosages, they're fine in the colonial port cities. But in large groups, the totoks, in fact, I think that's a term which uh, you, know, you are familiar with in Indonesia, has th that problem of assimilation. So I'm, I wonder with your, um, you know, you're, you're, you've edited a lot of books, if you can see the breadth of overseas Chinese history. Do you see a future for them here, or are, they, are we going to be the compradors of, of, of the 21st century? I would like to say this, yeah. The term, when we use the term overseas Chinese, as if that we are overseas, yeah. Are we overseas? Is this land our land? Is this, is, our, is this our homeland? The term overseas Chinese is misleading. I prefer to use the term ethnic Chinese, ethnic. Because the Chinese in China, they do not call themselves ethnic Chinese. They call themselves Han, Man, Meng, Hui, Zha. So if we continue to call ourselves overseas Chinese, then we really become overseas Chinese, which means that we are not really part of this land. We are planted from elsewhere. After addressing this, I would say that the Chinese, the ethnic Chinese in Southeast Asia is part and parcel of Southeast Asia. I cannot imagine what would Southeast Asia be or what would Southeast Asia have been without the ethnic Chinese. You cannot separate ethnic Chinese and Southeast Asia in every country. They are part and parcel of the state, part and parcel of the society. 
Now, because of this, sometimes I think perhaps of the uh, what you call a uh, misconception. We believe that the Chinese, once you are Chinese, you will remain a Chinese. Is it true? No. A lot of Southeast Asians who are in power now, they are of Chinese descent. But what we have seen, in fact, are the Chinese who have not been, quote, assimilated or integrated. Many of them are new migrants, perhaps. And many of them, perhaps, are living in a different type of state. Because if we live in Singapore, we cannot be assimilated into the indigenous, indigenous population because the Chinese here form the majority. But the Singapore Chinese are different from the Chinese in China. That one, I, I think we need to remember, you see. But, and then, is there a future, I think, for the Chinese in Southeast Asia? Or well, these two are general. Perhaps I think we need to analyze country by, by country. And then we should also, I think, analyze you know, you are the background of the person. Are you a capitalist, a rich man, or in fact you are only a professional and so forth. Perhaps their future would also be different. I think the future of the ethnic Chinese in South, the future of the ethnic Chi or Southeast Asian Chinese, I think, are in Southeast Asia for the majority. And because of this too, I think, we need to know more about ourselves before we can really win in every battle. Don't consider ourselves as the overseas Chinese. Because overseas Chinese, the term, is also a translation of Hua Xiao. The meaning of Hua Xiao, in fact, is Xiao Ju Zha Hai Wan Zhong Guo you are a soldier, a Chinese citizen who live overseas. And we are not Hua Chao. See? So I do not think that our future is somewhere else. Sorry.